नायक जगन्नाथ सिंह सी कैप्टन गुरबचन सिंह सराय डी मेजर धन सिंह थापा सर लाइफ है नहीं कुछ नहीं मालूम कुछ नहीं कौन सी लाइफ लाइन लेते हैं नहीं त्रिगुणी ओके कमिल आशा ओम प्रकाश जी अपनी तीसरी लाइफ लाइन त्रिगुणी का इस्तेमाल करेंगे इसे अंकित किया जाए त्रिगुणी आपकी बारी आ गई सेकंड मिलेगी आपको और वो शुरू हो गया है अब ये डी मेजर धन सिंह थापा है ये गोरखा राइफल्स के थे और मैं मेरा हॉबी है ऑटोग्राफ कलेक्ट करना तो ये रिपब्लिक डे परेड में पहले पहले चलते हैं जो हर बीच पर इनसे मिलने के लिए गया था मैं तब इनके बारे में पढ़ा था मैं तो आप निश्चिंत रहिए डी धन सिंह थापा परमवीर चक्र मिलर है नाइनटीन सिक्सटी टू वॉर में इनको मिला थैंक यू सर थैंक यू क्या करना चाहिए डी डी मेजर धन सिंह थापा फाइनल उत्तर आपका कंप्यूटर जी जीवन का एक लम्हा कैद होता है कुछ ऐसे ही लम्हों के लिए दिल्ली में एक प्रदर्शनी लगाई गई है जहां जाने वाली हस्तियों के साथ कुछ ऐसे चेहरे भी यहाँ दिखे जिनकी कुर्बानियों को नजरअंदाज नहीं किया जा सकता बेचे क्योंकि जो बच्चे लोग हैं उनको पता चलना चाहिए हमारे लिविंग लेजेंड है परमवीर चक्र अभिनर्स क्रिकेटर्स वगैरह तो लोग देख लेते और पहचान लेते हैं
so that's me. You had a brief this thing on what I did over the years. So let me go through my journey. So let's begin with the connection of these 12 qualities and the symbol. Can anyone tell me what these two 12 qualities are? Do you, have you seen it somewhere? Brand architects. The brand architect, right? Anywhere that you follow it? Yeah, in our own book. And that's what? Indian Army. The Indian Army. Very much similar to what you're doing and what we are doing. <coughs> right? Wow. So, let, so let's see what... We are also an artist. We rule sometimes. Definitely by heroes. We are great lovers. We are magicians. We are outlaws. We are explorers. We are all of that. Being in, the, being in the army or the armed forces. And I think you all also you know, follow these 12 principles of three types or 12 types of archetypes of Carl Jung. So let me bring out why we are similar. I started my journey in the uniform by being a scout. Anyone a scout here? Scout or a guy? All right, good. Okay, you're a guy? Yeah. yeah, wonderful. So you would know what this means. This is the motto of the Boy Scouts and Guides which is be prepared. Lord baden Paul had started this organization and that's how I got introduced to wearing the uniform. I wore the scout uniform when I was in third standard, I was a cub, then third, fourth, fifth, I was a cub and then from sixth standard onwards I was a scout and then I progressed, progressed and got the Rashtrapati scout which is the highest award. Now it's, it used to be called the President's scout, now it's called the Rashtrapati scout. It gave me an opportunity to go to Japan as a 11th grade kid, interact with uh, you know, scouts all over the world, but it taught me one major thing, which was be prepared. Be prepared for anything. If you're brief, if you're prepared for the worst, I'm sure you can handle any circumstances. I'm sure in your line of work also, you would have sometimes you not saved a particular file, you work for it the whole night. You have to be prepared. Maybe sometimes something goes wrong. Start over again because you know the basic whatever you've done, right? So you have to be prepared with whatever you're trying to do in your life. If you can follow this mode. I was lucky, I got inducted into the scouts, I had this motto every day, seeing this, wearing it in my badges, wearing it in my belt. It was a great learning for me. From scouts, as a kid I have been collecting autographs. You know who these guys are? Anyone? I'm talking with the other person. <laughs> All right, then Amitabh Bachchan and Shah Rukh, okay? Simple, Mukesh, Ambani, and Meeta. <coughs> okay, everybody recognizes this guy. What about these three? This guy you know. What about the other three? Anyone? Actual heroes. Hero was one of the 12 archetypes that you had. Right. Actual heroes of... Who are they? Let's have a look. The Palmi Chak. See what they have done. The three people were there. There was a Sikh gentleman, a Sadaji. See what he has done. Father and self-sacrifice in the presence of the enemy. Bama Singh, who captured the Siachen post for us at 21,000 feet in 1987 with minimal winter clothing. The temperatures there are minus 40 degrees. And he is a person who climbed 457 meter ice wall to capture the post because of which today we are safe and sound and having a you know discussion. Bama Singh, who got the Parambi Chakra, he's still alive, lives in Jammu. He was one of those three people who was with me. Who else was there? See, that's why he, he crawled, he closed in the advertise, he put the hand grenades and made sure the Pakistanis are, you know, driven away from that side. And the second person there was a gentleman called Yugendra Singh Yadav from the 18 Grenadiers. I'm sure you have heard of Tiger Hill yes. in Opvijay, Kargil. He was the man on 3rd and 4th of July 1999 who helped capture Tiger Hill for us. See what he did. Grenadier Yugendra Singh Yadav, he was from the 18 Grenadiers, he was an infantry regiment, and he went beyond the call of duty. He got three bullet wounds, two on his arm and one on his leg and still he destroyed two Pakistani bunkers and because of which he motivated the others to capture the location and because of which we ultimately you know stopped the war. That was Yogen Riyadh. And the third person that you see is Sanjay Kumar from the 13th Jammu and Kashmir Rifles. I'm sure you heard of Vikram Batra in Opija who said Dil Mangay Bor. 
he was along with him again at about 4,500 plus meters. All of them, these two, Sanjay Kumar and Yogendra Yadav were about 19, 20 years old, much younger to most of you all. But look at the gallant award that they did. They went and charged towards the bunker which had a machine gun and because of which the whole other platoon got inspired and that's how they captured. These are the actual heroes and I've been lucky that all three of them have come to my house and it's, it's much bigger than Sachin Tendulkar, Amitabh Bachchan or Shahrukh Khan. So, that, that is, so collecting autographs and I got to meet these personalities. And then I got inspired by this saying which is there in Kohima. Kohima which is in Nagaland. There's a very famous saying in the epitaph there which says when you go home, tell them of us and say for your tomorrow we gave our today. This is what is written in Kohima. These soldiers who have died for the country have given their today for all of us. For all of us so that we can live peacefully. We can be with our families. We can go to the movies. We can do what we want. It's because of sacrifices made by the soldiers wherever they are. Whether it's in the eastern sector or the western sector or the northern sector. These are the people. And this is in Kohima <coughs> in World War II when our soldiers gave a lot of life. It inspired me a lot. And that's how I joined this wonderful academy right after 12. I went to school, B.A. Senior Secondary School in Mayrapo. And then I joined the National Defense Academy. Anyone been there? Anyone knows where National Defense Academy is? Karakwasla. Yeah. Karakwasla in Pune. And the motto there is service before self. It's a three year training. I went as a young boy, wet right behind the years, 18 years old, and came out as a man. In three years, they drilled me to make sure that I put service before self. And every day we say this in our prayer that God please give us strength to serve our country and put service before, before self. self. Similarly, you also can put an organization which is your organization or let's say if you put your family, then you think about your own comforts which I'll come to you. This is National Defense Academy where I did three years. I went as a boy, came back as a man and then I went to Indian Military Academy which is in Dehradun. Have you anyone been to Dehradun? No. Have you been to Dehradun? Yeah. All right. So this is Indian Military Academy. This is where the Army officers are trained. National Defense Academy, Army, Navy, Air Force, all three are trained. This is specialized training only for the Army. So after three years, I went for one year to Indian Military Academy. And the motto and the uh, you know, credo there is this. The safety, honor and welfare of your country comes first, all always and every time. The honor, welfare and comfort of the men you command come next. <coughs> your own ease, comfort and safety come last, always and every time. So if an organization, you have to put your organization, you have to put five brand labs as the, as, as the country, you know, you should put that as your main aim. Then you have to put the people work under you. Similarly, you will have your own teams, people who come and serve you, you know, coffee, tea, they are the people that you command. The people who work under you, you have to keep them motivated. Your own comfort should come in last. Oh, my desk is not there, my leave is not gone, I have to go for this chupti. You have to make sure that everybody works as a team. And this is what they drill into us in the Indian Military Academy. As an officer, as a leader, you have to put the men who are under you always before you. And of course, the country comes first always and every time. So if you can keep this mindset, which we were trained for one year, you will be a leader to begin with. But that doesn't end there because this is more theoretical. So you'll have to go on ground and practice. So I had a great opportunity. I was posted right after Indian Military Academy. I passed out in 1997. I became a commissioned officer. And like a good young uh, soldier or a good young officer, I wanted to see action. And I was posted in the place where action took place. That was in 1998 in Jammu and Kashmir. And I was lucky. I got to you know face bullets, live bullets straight into one year of my service and this is the place where the action took place. Can you guess what altitude this is? What height? This is at 10,000 feet. Alright? And where the action took place, which is in the jungles about this, is 13,000 feet. So on the, third, on the 1st of July 1998, we got information that there were some terrorists who have crossed over to the Indian territory. We don't know the numbers, we don't know where they are going, but they are somewhere in the close by area. So I was one year into, into the Indian Army as a young leader. So I took out a patrol of about 10 odd Jawans under me and we moved to a place which is close to this place called Gormatnar Gali in Kupwara district. 
Heard of Kupwara district? Yes. Okay, that's in Jammu and Kashmir. And we went there, this was the first, we got the information about 6 o'clock in the evening, raining cats and dogs, but we knew the area well. We went, reached the location by about 9.15 the night, and then it's pitch dark, raining, nothing happened, we were really tired. So next day morning, we got information that yes, there's no information on where they've gone, but yes, we will carry out a search in that area and see if we can get these guys. So a search party came from the other side of the ridge. We met each other, then when they were going back, they encountered terrorists. You want to sit down? No, I'm sure. They encountered terrorists. They found three terrorists and they killed two of them. This was at about 12.45 in the afternoon and one escaped. So that party took those two dead bodies and we were tasked to run behind that one terrorist. So we lost altitude, went on the other side, searched the whole, till the whole time till the time light was available. We couldn't find that guy. We came back and sat down. This was the second night. No food for the first night, no food for the second night. Second night, weather was a little better. It was not raining, but because of the rains, we were also, and this is actually 13,000 in July, pretty cold in Kashmir. And about four o'clock on the third, early morning, the sentry saw some people crossing, let's say about 100 yards away from where we were. We were on this side across the, uh, you know, a little bit of depression. We saw, I mean, he saw some people and by the time he woke me up and gave me the binocular, uh, the night vision goggles, I could see some two, three guys crossing. I knew they were not our own troops. I knew they were maybe militants, but we were not sure. So we took a conscious decision, waited till about 6.30. We went on the, upper, on the other side and we saw the footprints and we said, okay, now let's follow them. But the greatest learning that we had, we knew the area very well. We knew where we are going, unlike the terrorists. So we knew if, if he has to cross this open space, he's going to be killed, <coughs> he's going to be exposed. He can't do that in the daylight hours. So we'll have to restrict him to this jungles before it's night. So we came down, we started about 6.30, 6.45 in the morning, and about 9.45, they saw us, and they started firing. So we split into two, we were totally 11, I and <coughs> 10 more Jawans, so we split into two uh, you know, parties, and within about 45 minutes, we eliminated whatever firing was coming. It was such a chaotic thing, and in that, there were two terrorists right in front of me. One was having a universal machine gun, which is a very potent weapon, unlike the weapons that we were carrying. We were carrying our own personal weapon, which is like the INSAS rifle. But the universal machine gun is a very fast machine gun and it can fire more potently. But I was young, so the mind was also crazy. When charged at that guy and we killed that militant, that me and my buddy killed those two militants. And after 45 minutes, we saw that there's no firing coming. And when we did a count up, we found that there were six militants who have died. So that on the first day, two, on the next, six. And within half an hour, one of them had escaped to another location, to another ambush, so another was shot. So two plus six, eight plus one, nine, and the next day we killed two more. So we killed 11 militants in a span of three days. It was a whole group of militants who had crossed over from Pakistan, and they were one of the first of that year's batch and they were all heavily armed. Each of them were carrying an individual weapon. Four of them were carrying pistols. Each of them were carrying about 50,000 Afghani currency. They were carrying RDX, they were carrying detonators, and they were carrying rations for themselves. You know? So this is the huge catch and Independence Day was approaching. So these guys were planning something. They were planning something to be done for the Independence Day. So we had thwarted them right close to the border. And why, how could we do this? Because of this. We knew the area and we believed in this mantra that the more you sweat in peace, the less you will bleed in war. In this complete operation, we didn't have a single scratch in any of my boys. And I'm proud to say that in my 21 years of service in the Indian Army, not a single Jawan of mine has ever got injured. You know, that's, that's, that's really Similarly, in your line of work, the more and more you hone your skills, the more and more you practice, the faster you'll be able to do or the more efficient work you'll be able to do when there's pressure. For you, it's not peace or war. For you, it is a deadline that you have to meet. So if you do, let's say you're working in Illustrator or you're working in InDesign or you're working in 
you're maybe doing something in Code and Draw. If you know how the software works and how it works, faster and train yourself as well as keep your ears and eyes open and get to know more knowledge about what's going on. When there's a deadline, when you have to produce a work quickly, you will be succeeding. So the more you sweat in peace, the less you will bleed in war. This is a mantra you can follow anytime in your life, anywhere in your life. It need not be peace and war, it need not be blood and sweat. It could be anything. It could be hard work during your day-to-day -day thing. Don't think, oh, when that situation comes, I'll deal with it. You have to practice. You'll have to do it. You know? Maybe it's video editing. Maybe it's graphics. Maybe it's some copy. Maybe it's some English language or maybe some vernacular. Practice, practice, practice. And when it's required, you will deliver it well. So this was... This came in handy because of which I was awarded the Shorya Chakra, which is the third highest gallantry award in India. I was lucky to be presented by the President of India in Rashtrapati Bhavan. Very few people get this while they're alive. Most of them get it posthumous. I was lucky, one, because I was young, I did crazy things, and two, we didn't have a single casualty. So I think that played, and that's what is written in the citation that was given. And then, over the years, I didn't find this guy. Yeah. yeah. Over the years, I got to meet this gentleman. You know who he is? Yeah. Mahi? All right. MS Dhoni, who also won, you know, the World Cup. And, but for him, this was more important. Wearing the uniform and wearing the pair of wings that he's wearing. And we became friends. We are friends from 2009. And over the years, I've learned so much from him, which I thought I should share with you, all of you. Because you all might have seen him only as a cricketer. Only as a cricket, uh, cricket on the field. But there's much more to MS Dhoni. Cricket was just 5% of what MS Dhoni is. The rest of 95% is an amazing human being. What did he teach me? This is one of the, one of the, my best moments in life. Recognized when was this? The day after he won. The yes, World. 2nd of April 2011 when we won. This is 3rd of April 2011. And this picture is, uh, let's say, about 1 o'clock in the night. And this is 5 o'clock in the morning. Super excited, India has won the World Cup. I'm holding the World Cup, I'm holding his medal, <coughs> taking a picture. We watched the whole match, I saw him shave off his head. We watched the match again on TV. Six o'clock, he said, sir, I'm going to I've got a photo shoot. I said, okay, I'll also leave because I'm also super tired. I leave, at about eight o'clock, I put this picture up on mine to my friends on Facebook, on Gmail, and things like that, you know. And at about 11 o'clock, this picture comes on TV saying that Dhoni ne Munden, everybody understand a little bit of Hindi? Yeah, yeah. Okay? Dhoni ne Munden kya? Why did Dhoni shave off his head? You know? And it says exclusive pictures. And I was shocked because people are calling me up and saying, wow, what a picture. Nobody has seen this picture of you know, Dhoni being bald. The world has not seen this picture. And I was feeling so guilty, you know? Here is a personal picture of mine, and this is his bed. Actually, he's actually sleeping on the other side. No, this is a personal picture, and this TV channel had put it up everywhere, and I felt so guilty that you know this is something that is a privacy has been breached, and what would Dhoni think about it? You know? And there's no way that I could reach Dhoni because he, he also must be sleeping, and he had a photo shoot, huge security. But luckily, we had already coordinated that both of us will go to the airport together. I was supposed to come to Chennai, you were supposed to go to Delhi. And I said, if I come along within the airport, I'll get an easy route and there will be security and things like that. So there won't be any traffic. And I meet him at about 9 o'clock in the night. And everybody is like taunting me and saying, Sir, you have a photo, aagya. your photograph is there everywhere on the TV and all that. And I go and tell MS that, MS, I'm really sorry. You know, this picture has come on TV and I'm very, very sorry this has happened. He said, sir, uh, which TV? I said, which TV means? So he said, which channel it has come? I said, it's coming in India TV, you know, it's coming in India TV. And whole, everybody is picking it up, saying that curse in India TV, and it's say exclusive, exclusive. He said, sir, so why are you getting perturbed? I said, no, MS, this is a personal photograph. I'm really sorry. I've not given the picture. They just picked it up from somewhere. And he said, sir, uh, but only if you watch India TV will you get perturbed, right? I've not watched India TV. I'm not perturbed. Here's the man who should be actually perturbed. That his picture has been put. But he simply took out the burner of my heart by saying, why do you get perturbed? Because this is something in your control, whether you want to watch India TV or not. The remote is in your hand. 
You don't watch India TV, you won't even come to know this picture is there. Isn't it? So that's what he taught me, this mantra that he taught me, that control the controllables. Very, very important mantra that he taught me through just one example in my life. That control the controllables, it's in your hand. Whether it's your professional relationship, whether it's your personal relationship, whether it's your work that you do, it's in your hands, whether you want to be happy or you want to be sad. Happiness and sadness, the switch is in your hands. The remote is in your hands. How you want to be perturbed, how do you want to deal with life? How do you want to deal with situations in work, in life, in your relationships? It's all in your hands. Nobody can ever dictate whether you can be happy or you can be sad. If you can remember this, that nobody can ever dictate that to you. Whether it's your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your parents or your bosses, nobody can dictate. It's only you who got the control. You got the remote in your hand. And this, in spite of being in the army, in spite of being level-headed, I have to learn it through an incident which I was lucky because of my friendship with <coughs> MSD. And if you had seen on, on ground, this is how he deals with in cricket too. For him, winning and losing is, is just an end product. For him, the process is important. So if you have your processes right, the end product will automatically come to be correct most of the times. It will not be always correct. For every 80 times, there will be some 5 or 6 times that will be wrong. You know, but if you do the processes right, from 80 you will go on to 90. And at some point of time it will be 99. You can never do 100% perfect. So the processes has to be correct. And that's what he displays on the cricket field. He believes in these two things. The process is correct. Winning and losing is part of life. Sometimes you'll win, sometimes you'll lose. Whether it's getting a contract or whether you need to meet a deadline. But if your processes are correct, if you're honest, if you do the correct dealings, most of the times you'll take correct decisions and your end result will be correct. This is something that I learned through this uh, honorary lieutenant colonel whom I helped get the rank in the army. And then I served in the army for 21 years, commanded a unit in Bagdogra, and I retired in 2017. Voluntary retirement, so people were surprised. Why did I retire so young? I could have gone on to become a brigadier or a general. But then I realized there's much more to life than just rights and perks and privileges. It's much more to life. So I said, okay, this is something that really touched me. The Indian Army has got loses two types of soldiers. The first are the people who die in combat, like in action, somebody's got shot. The other type of soldiers are people who die in accidents, suicides, medical conditions, fratricides. If they were, let's say, working in fire brand labs, then it should not happen. But if it happens, I'm sure the spouse well, might get another opportunity, maybe to work here, or some kind of comp compassionate posting. But in the army, we can't give anything to the spouse. Unlike other government, if it's railways, if it's banks, and the spouse also gets some kind of employment. And the spouse, overnight, loses everything that she had. The widow, she loses everything. Or if roti, kapra and makan, roti and makan just goes away. And we lose 2,000 jawans like this every year because of medical condition, suicide, fratricide, accidents, whether it's road accidents, lightning, drowning, snake bite, heart attack, suicide, another jawan killing another jawan, 2,000 is a large, large number. And unfortunately, these widows only get about 30% pension. 260% pension if it's attributed to the service. That's about 9,000 to about 16,000 rupees. When I started interacting with these widows, I realized that the first and the only thing that they miss is not money. What they miss is the connect. They miss that nobody is keeping in touch with them. What generally happens is when the man dies, they get a lump sum money because of insurance and gratuity and things like that. So the girl goes to the in-laws place. That's the only place she can go to. She's got two children who are studying in good school, maybe in PSC in a secondary school when they were posted in Chennai. Now she has to go to some interior village because that's where the in-laws are. Most of our Jawans come from an agricultural <coughs> background. This 15-20 lakhs survives till about 2-3 years. After that, she's in a very bad state. She's more or less like a maid. She gets abused by her father-in-law, brother-in-law. She has no role to play in the house. She says, okay, my life is gone. At least for my children's sake, let me move up. The army, unfortunately, is still corresponding with the address that they had of the in-laws. 
So the connect is lost after three, four years. So I said, first and foremost, let's build the connect. So samband means connect. In Hindi, samband means connect. So it's more important for us to establish connect. At least go and speak to them. What do they want? What are the children doing? So when I, in fact, so I said, okay, let me database all of them. So I started this project. It's a thousand day project. We all are philanthropic. I do it as a one man project, no NGO, nothing. I said, okay, let me connect to all the widows. Let me start off with the last 20 years because they are in the educational background. The children would be in the educational background. And the army has got a lot of educational grants for them. Unfortunately, they're not claiming it because of lack of awareness. So let me build up the connect. Let me build up the awareness. And I would do about 600 days. And I've had great, great, great stories to tell. Some of them, this young boy, Nandabala, uh, the husband died uh, due to uh, mysterious illness. Nobody knew why. The family was from Tanjavur. I had gone to my village. I said, okay, let me search for anyone who is close to my village. And I found this address to be about hardly about four kilometers from my village. I went to that place. That was the in-laws place. I found the brother-in-law who just nearly threw me out saying that she's not here. She's taken whatever she has to take. We have given her whatever we have to give. We don't know where she is. I said, at least give me the address or telephone number. He was not willing to give. It took me a lot of efforts. I tracked down the family and I found out that the, the family lives very close to where I grew up in Mandavali. Found out this boy who was the son of that Jawan, who clearly says I want to be an army doctor. Very sharp boy. At the age of four, he could tell all the countries and capitals. He can play the keyboard. He's very good in you know computer photo, I mean, Photoshop and software like that. He can, he can he does shooting, he's good in academics, he wants to pursue medicine. I connected with him last year in December and now because of uh, you know, good people who have been helping him out, the army first of all has given whatever the grant is, now he's going to a coaching institute to study for medicine, he studies in KV, academically we have tried to give him a new laptop, we have got him a coaching this thing in, uh, for shooting and now at least the summon is there, the connect is there. If not anything else, it's not money always. It could be small things, but just visiting them, wishing them on their, you know, on, on festive occasions. Similarly, I keep traveling all over India. The couple of cases in Himachal, top one, there was a young uh, boy who died, and that's his father, who's also in the army. But the daughter in law is looked after by the uh, father in law. Financially, they are better off, but of course, nobody can replace a husband and the loss of a, a, a male member of the family. And the opposite thing, this lady and the young daughter, she travels every day about four kilometers just walking to go to the road head. <coughs> then she has to travel about 35 minutes on bus to go to a college. She's pursuing a BCom. Come back all before last light, before it becomes dark. The only two ladies were living there. It's very difficult for single ladies to live in an isolated place. They didn't know much about their army documentation, so I helped them fill up the forms. Now we are in touch, we'll get them some grants. And these are just a couple of examples. I try and bring out, try and go and meet them, try and build awareness in people so that they can go and meet, first within the organization, within the army, and of course with the civilians and the well-wishers who want to. So the many ways people are helping me out, some people are helping me out financially, some people are helping me out by volunteering. When they go to their villages, I give them an address, they go and look them up and say, okay, connect with them. If they've got children who are studying, help them with that, help them get the, this thing. So this has brought me a lot of satisfaction in my life. This is something that every, every day I feel, yes, I need to contribute more. This is much more than the perks and privileges I've got in the army or by earning. I, I'm, I just live on my pension. I spend my money for travel and food and stay to do this, but it gives me a lot of satisfaction. It's not about money all the time. It's about how much you can contribute to the society. And these husbands, the husbands of these widows, have actually given up the life of the country. Whether it's operation or whether it's any other circumstances, if there were any other civilian circumstances, it would have been much different. Here are the people who have joined voluntarily into the Indian Army and they have given their lives. And this is the least that we can do, at least to look after their families. Because their families are also sacrificed as much as the Jawan is sacrificed. So it gives me a lot of satisfaction, but I'm just way, way behind the target that I want to meet. 
I want to do all this in thousand days when I want to reach out to all the 40,000 plus <coughs> children and make sure that they get this. It's a challenge, but I get my strength from looking after these uh, people. And then, of course, all this comes from this one major aim that I have. People talk about country, people talk about institutions, but I always believe that this is the guiding force for me. This always inspires me. You know what is this? Everybody knows, right? You know why it flutters? Why does it flutter? Anyone? Why does it flutter? AMD or Take a guess. There is life in it. There's life in it. That's good. This thing. Let's uh, uh, let's get some creative answers. Why do you think it flutters? Huh? Anything? Take a guess. Naji, what do you think? Why do you think it flutters? It has to be some reason. Some reason has to be there. Why it flutters? You see, you go everywhere. The flag flutters, right? Why does it flutter? Wind. 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 wind? Great. Do you think it's wind? I don't believe it's wind. Our flag does not fly because the wind moves it. It's because the last breath of every soldier, every soldier when he dies, the last breath, that combines and makes sure that our flag flutters every time. We have to make sure that we remember the last breath of every soldier. It's because of his last breath that this flag flutters. And we make sure that we live up to the expectations of the last breath of every soldier who served for the country. And make sure that we serve the the only symbol that we have for India, which is <coughs> the Indian flag. So I believe that it flutters because of the last breath of the soldier. <coughs> and to substantiate that, I've got something here with me. It comes out from a bag here. And let's see what is there. I need uh, two volunteers. I've got a small bag here. And it's got some colors, ribbons. Okay? Come here. Look, you come and you come. Raja. Yes. Okay, what colors? White. You want white? What colors? Green? Okay. And I keep this. And you see that this is empty? Alright? Are you sure this is empty? Yes, Raja? Okay, I'll put the saffron first inside. Okay? Then I'll take the white and put it inside and we put the green inside. Okay? We see, put all this three and then we say the magical words. What shall we say? I will say Jai Hind and you'll all say Jai Hind. Alright? Jai Hind! Jai Hind! I can't hear you well. Jai Hind! Jai Hind! Jai Hind! Jai Hind! Jai Hind! Jai Hind! Alright? So you can hold this. You can hold it. And you can see there's nothing here also. Alright? So this is what inspires me, the Indian flag, and I think it should inspire all of you that this symbol of our country is what we should all work for, whether it's in the civil, whether it's private, whether it's the armed forces or any other face of life. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me and trying, let me tell you about my story and about my love for the country. Thank you very much.